Welcome back to The Debrief. It's just another weekend, but of course, the Salt Lake City World Cup just wrapped up. As always, I'm Tyler Norton, joined by John Bergman, who writes the competition recaps for Climbing Magazine and is the author of High Drama, The Rise, Fall, and Rebirth of American Competition Climbing. Sorry, I lost the button there for a second, a bit of a cliffhanger to see what exactly John wrote, but you all know if you watch it every week. And of course, our special guest for this week is Megan Martin, pro climber, commentator, television host now, of course, uh, and she was commentating Salt Lake City with Matt Groom, which was a change by itself, which we'll uh, talk about later on, I'm sure. Anyway, I got my desert shirt on. I bought this in like Vail 2016, so I got my little cactus shirt ready to go, trying to keep with the theme of... Uh, of, uh, of the sand and the heat and everything that went on. But uh, let's dive right into the competition climbing. And as always, our special guest always goes first. So in terms of the headlines, Megan, uh, what was the headline from Salt Lake City 2023? So my headline is boulders, bees, and blazing sun, which <laughs> I will say blazing sun is better than the downpour the year before because rain as we've seen is not the best and especially with the athletes already having to deal with that in Seoul and it kind of messing everything up I was mm -hmm. I was happy that there was no rain but yes it was super hot I I don't know I I kind of felt dumb I was like I don't remember that Salt Lake City can get this hot like it was it was very hot um and I know some of the competitors felt that obviously as everyone knows, some people thrive in different temperatures more than others. And I know that that was kind of difficult for some people, especially for speed, like that wall sat in the sun up until they did their races, basically. And like, it was lucky that it even went into the shade. I but, was making fun of all their sunglasses because I thought they looked ridiculous. And I'm like, why are you guys all wearing like a meme costume for this? But then I noticed the angle of the sun in the evening was like, was actually still like on the wall. It was kind of nuts. Yeah, it doesn't like the sun doesn't really go down until like seven or eight o'clock and, and it's still like kind of sunny, but it kind of drops a little behind the trees. So it alleviates some of the excessive heat, but yeah, it was really, really hot. Like, and I know for Matt and I, there was like a 30 minute window where it was like shining right into the side of our eyes. Like I remember I was like commentating like this <laughs> and like, it was like, why does Megan have a hangover during this whole competition? What's going on? <laughs> I know I probably look like like drunk and trying to survive in the sun but yeah no it was kind of funny but um yeah I feel like the boulders were really exciting I feel like the root setters did a really good job with the diver diversity of the boulders throughout all the rounds obviously I think you know some people were a little disappointed with the qualification round being a little or a little on the easier side but at the end of the day like you know that promotes having to be efficient which is another skill set that everybody needs so I, I personally don't think it was a bad thing um but then for the semis and the finals I think they did a stellar job separation wise diversity of the boulders and they were all just really exciting so I thought that was really cool I think that's a pretty good summary of like what the what the entire event was and what we came away with John like you at the first Salt Lake City I wasn't there but I think I remember you saying it was real hot but you guys were in like a junkyard parking lot or something like in a construction <laughs> zone i'm sure it felt way worse <laughs> you, you did okay um but then last year when we were there we did have some like really cold cold i guess it would have been the evenings for the finals and stuff but we like the coats we were wearing weren't cold enough so uh yeah salt lake city is a little bit temperamental but you're right at least this time around it wasn't a ton of rain yeah, I remember in yeah in previous years, maybe it was last year, we were joking about the the Indonesian team, the speed climbers. They were so bundled up because, of course, you know they come from like the tropical country, and so we were saying, "Geez, to to those that squad, this must be frigid, absolutely cold." I mean, they were wearing every item of clothing they had. So uh, luckily, uh, it sounds like it was a little warmer this year. I. I I agree, Megan. It just, it was a great event overall. Great, really good setting. I thought the the men's setting in the final, I couldn't decide if I thought it was a little bit undercooked or not. It was kind of like right on the edge for me. There were a lot of tops. There were a lot of flashes. But in the end, I kind of came away thinking, no, overall, like I thought the setting was, was good. And I think we should acknowledge the crowd also. The crowd was just so loud even on the la on the live stream, it, it was just roaring. And I know a lot of the competitors have mentioned how great the crowd was. It, it seems like the crowd gets better and better each year in Salt Lake City. And for this year in particular, I was kind of wondering what that was due to. Was it because 
uh, obviously the weather maybe played a part, but was it also due to maybe the increased star power of, you know, Natalia and, and a Brooke, of course, and, and Sean Bailey is a superstar when he's climbing in Salt Lake City. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm curious to hear what you both maybe think or, or attribute the, the, <laughs> the increased crowd size and crowd buzz to, but it was great overall. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the weather definitely helped. But I will say, too, I met so many people in the crowd that were like, I flew from New York. I flew from North Carolina. I flew from Florida. And I was thinking to myself, wow, you <laughs> traveled all the way out here to watch this World Cup. That's so cool. And I'm not sure if that was the case before, you know, other than people's like family members. So I do think part of that could be also because we've had so many U.S. athletes do so incredible at these World Cups. And it's like, now you're coming to the World Cup and there's a likelihood that someone from your country is going to be in the final. And I think that's something that people want to see in person. I was going to say that my lasting memory from last year, of course, was like the torrential downpour. And we were lucky enough to be just under the tent. But for everybody else, it was like, man, it's you have to be a diehard to want to be out in the cold and the rain and stuff. But yeah, I think I saw a photo. Was it uh, was it Gilu Lo's family was there or something? But there was a group photo of all these people that just came to, to see her compete. And that's always cool. And maybe there's a little bit of like uh, kind of like a bump because of scarcity. Now that there's only one weekend of, of competing in Salt Lake. Maybe it's like, hey, we all got to be at this one. You can't can't pick and choose between the two weekends or something. I don't know. But uh, Salt Lake City is a good, smart climbing city. So I think like yeah. whoever does show up, they they kind of know what's up and they're probably psyched about it. So yeah, good, uh, good crowd overall. Um, John, what was oh. or go ahead. I was just going to say it was really cool to see all the athletes get mobbed by fans, too. Um, not just the athletes competing, but also other athletes that came to watch uh, that, you know, maybe focus more on outdoor climbing. Uh, they were all getting bombarded with you know, selfies, photos, autographs. And I, you know, I don't think, I mean, obviously that does happen in our sport, but I don't think it happens as much. So it was really cool to see those athletes have that experience. That's who is there, who is hanging out. Like, I know, like, I, I kind of assume like maybe somebody like Sean Rabatou would have been there because he's usually around when Brooks in town, but. Yeah, he did get to come, which was great because I know he had something right before. So it was really cool. And he definitely got super bombarded. He was like, wow, I've never experienced <laughs> that before. And I was like, yeah, that, I mean, that's awesome. Like, psyched for you. I was like, you know, people love Mellow. Like, I don't know. Like, you shouldn't be surprised because people are pretty obsessed. Like, I go into the gym and, like, every, like, 20 to 27-year-old dude, like, is wearing a Mellow shirt or talking about one of the videos that just came out. Um, so it's cool to see that happen. It's cool. Yeah, John, what uh, what was your headline from uh, from Salt Lake? Before you go into your headline, we do yeah. have to be. Yo, oh, yes, okay. So we, missed yeah. a, we missed a critical part of this. Yeah. <laughs> Seagate during the women's final for speed. Poor Juliana Randy. There was a bee that would not get out of her way. So that was like what we were delayed like three minutes or something. But this like giant bee, which Matt and I thought were, was hilarious because then we were making bee puns the whole time. But yeah, it was kind of crazy to have some sort of insect or something interfere with the flow of the competition. And she handled it like a pro, but obviously that's really hard, you know, especially for speed. It's so ritualistic and, you know, you go out there, you get ready and you go. You're not really expecting there to be some sort of natural interference. <laughs> I, I'm glad you pointed out that that would be hard to get over as a competitor. I mean, even when they shoo the bee away, which they did at first, who's to say the bee's not just going to land higher up and you're going to have a handhold and, and you don't expect to do that on artificial holds. Obviously it's more of an outdoor climbing thing uh, when you might yeah, run into wildlife. I was going to say, people uh, don't realize how, how similar to outdoor climbing speed climbing is guys. Like we got the, we got all the, all the same risks and dangers. Like, I don't know what these people are talking about. I did want to say props to like the team in the production van. Cause they were doing like CNN level coverage of this B issue, like camera angles just changing all the time. Never lost track of it. It was, it was like a funny break in the action, but yeah, kind of a, it, it just makes you realize like for me as somebody that, I, I try to organize a couple comps uh, like every season or be involved. I'm like, oh, I, what's, what's my protocol for like an insect? Uh, like, what, do, what do I do about that? Especially when it flies, like, do, do we just got to keep a swatter around? Like, what's our policy? I don't think we have one. So not that it's going to come up very often, but yeah, um, 
I'm not sure that's in like the event organizer handbook of the IFSC, and maybe that'll come up at the next uh, officials meeting or something. Yeah. Athletes Commission, get on it. What yeah, should we do? Yeah, and, yeah. And, Can you imagine if that's the thing that the Athletes Commission gets vocal about after just like being dormant and not talking about all these like huge issues? And they're like, we must do something about the bees. Anyway. It's the bees. It's a problem. The yeah. bees. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll say this for my headline. It, the most anticipated bouldering comp in recent memory now looms on the calendar. And of course I'm talking about the Prague world cup. And I, I think it might be a little strange to, 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 to mention Prague when talking about a headline for Salt Lake city. But of course, all the intrigue around Prague is founded upon or is anchored by what happened here at, in Salt Lake city uh, we mentioned at the top of the broadcast, Yanya Garnbrett is set to return in Prague. I think it's fitting that Natalia wins in Salt Lake City, and then before the live stream even ends, Matt Groom and, and yourself, Megan, you were talking about, oh, Prague's up next, and Yanya's going to return, and Natalia's in back to her winning ways. It's like already that rivalry was top of mind before this Salt Lake City uh, live stream even ended and and I think it's maybe the most anticipated Prague meaning maybe the most anticipated bouldering comp since what Vail 2019 maybe when there was the question about whether Yanya was going to sweep that 2019 season there was a lot of hype for for that I, I think what's really exciting is it's easy to think that the intrigue for this Yanya Natalia rivalry goes back a season and a half, right? Back last season, uh, Yanya wins in Mayringen and then steps aside and Natalia just romps through the rest of the season. But when you think about it, their rivalry or whatever we want to call it goes back longer than that. If you go back to the 2021 season, Yanya wins in Mayringen to kick off that season. And then Natalia eventually beats Yanya at one of the Salt Lake City World Cups. And then in Innsbruck, Yanya barely beats Natalia. They they both had three tops in in those finals. So this is really a a multi year rivalry. And I'll stand by what I've said for a long time is that I think this is one of the most intriguing rivalries that we've had maybe ever in the sport of comp climbing. And now we are situated to get another chapter in that here in in Prague coming up in. Two weeks. Like, it certainly wasn't the plan, but it's crazy to think that, oh yeah, it's been over a year since we've gotten to see these two compete against each other on a boulder wall. And that always like that always catches me off guard when I realize, wow, it's actually been that long. Um, I think you're completely right saying it is the most anticipated boulder comp, at least for like the nerds that watch this every single weekend, right? Um, I'm super excited. Yeah. But Megan, what did you think? Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think it's also interesting because you know, they've both been dealing with things, too. Natalia's had some health issues. Yanya's coming back from an injury. So they're kind of, we don't really know where either of them, I mean, we kind of know more, I guess, where Natalia is because she just had a really good weekend. But neither of them are probably still in tip-top shape, which is interesting because usually maybe one person is, one person isn't. But they're both kind of like, hmm, recovering. <laughs> There's these big question marks around each of them for very different reasons. And maybe we'll get into more of that. Maybe we can get into more of Natalia as we go into this into this this episode here. But I think for Yanya in particular, we were talking about this a little bit off off air before we started. She she's coming back in Prague. There's no reason to think she's not the crusher that she has always been. But yet you just look, we haven't seen her in uh, an international level bouldering comp in more than a year. We know she's in great lead shape because she just won lead nationals in Slovenia, but that's not an international, that's not a world cup. And that's also a different discipline. So uh, that's just, that just adds to the intrigue here is that there are so many question marks with, with both of them. But I would say that watching her climb with a boot on one legged was insane. Um, <laughs> I, I yeah. feel like she's still Yanya at the end of the day and yeah, hopefully she feels good, right? That's like the most important. And I'm sure I have no doubt that she will perform to her ability regardless. 
Yeah, I think I think that's probably the best bet. Like again, really no reason aside like unless you think that hey, she hurt her toe and therefore she like stopped training or like lost the psych or is like less of a professional than she was before. I and I don't think any of those things are true. So I think um I think she's still the favorite to win every comp after this basically. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it is cool to see how the gap has closed a bit with some of the other athletes too. So because I feel like, you know, before it was really a back and forth between Natalia and Yanya, but now I think, you know, some of these other athletes are closing that gap more. So now I think there are more what ifs in general. Hmm. I'm not sure. Like, I think we'll continue. Okay. I feel yeah, I think I think I'm gonna follow up on that, but in in a little bit when we get to the winners. Um, okay. <laughs> I want to just because I don't think we're going to talk about speed climbing too much, especially after we just did like a um, like a pure speed episode of the debrief last week. And nobody watches any content about speed, but we got to talk about it uh, at least <laughs> once in this entire in this entire show. And what I wanted to bring up was like, I think it was last year. I just made like a smarmy tweet because there was some speed comp where everything just fell apart, like all the favorites lost. People were falling, false starts everywhere. And I just made this tweet that said, like, speed climbing abhors a clear storyline. Like, whatever you think is going to happen, whatever, you know, whatever the hero arc is for the event, they're going to lose. Everything's going to get messed up. Like, speed's just crazy all the time. But this season so far is completely turning that on its head to the point where it's like speed climbing is, for the first time in a long time, it adores a clear storyline. And the men's side has been a little bit solid where if you aren't, familiar with speed it's very easy to point to Vedric and Kiramal and say watch these two guys they keep going back and forth over who is the fastest man on earth and at least one of them always gets to finals pretty much and if you get the you know the lucky chance of both of them racing against each other it's going to blow your mind right so we've had them to rely on for about a season now but on the women's side what I wanted to point out is aside from you know, we all know that Alexandra Mirasaw is, of course, extremely consistent and hasn't lost a race all season. There is this other character that has been creeping behind in the background, and that is Desak Made, who has also not lost any races at all this season except against Alexandra Miroslaw. That's the only person she loses these races to, and she has medaled either in second place or third place at every event this year so far. And so there's now this extra tension, not just of oh, is Alexandra going to manage to win this event again? But also, if she doesn't, it's pretty clear who that second-tier athlete is going to be that steals it because Dezak has been super consistent beating everybody in her path. And the only person stopping her is the current top slot, Ola Miroslaw. So I think now is a great time. If you're trying to sell the idea of a speed comp to a friend or to someone it's so easy to describe what the tension of the event is now. For the men's side, you've got the two Indonesian guys. And for the women's side, you've got Ola and you've got Dezak. And that's the easiest two two little things to, uh, to, to hold on to. And you're always going to get at least three of those athletes all the way into the big final, yeah. right? Um, or into the semifinals and finals, I, I should say. Um, so my headline kind of for this part of the season, this first half of the speed season is... Don't take this for granted because speed climbing is normally crazy, but we're in this really lucky oasis. If we continue the desert theme, we're in this oasis of like coherent speed storylines. And it's so fun to watch now that you can like have an expectation for next week's comp and, and, you know, kind of expect some actual action from particular stars. I'm over the moon about it. I also think it's like a good build going into world championships too, since this is like so important for speed with it being the first time that they have their own discipline for the Olympics. I feel like that's, it's kind of working out perfectly story-wise, right? It's not so chaotic. It's slowly building, but there is this tension between mm -hmm. these two athletes on both sides and it keeps it super exciting. That's a really good point. It's nice too, because I think the, the world championship, the build to that, keeps Alexandra uh, kind of participating, frankly, because one of the things we've said about her in the past is that she's got these great streaks, but it's they're spread out over so many seasons. She, she'll do a couple comps and then she'll take some time off. And, and so it's it makes it kind of harder to assess her seasons and to assess her streak because she's not present for every single World Cup. Or And, and yet, as she said in her interview after this event in Salt Lake, she's she's kind of using these World Cups as training for the World Championships. And so presumably then she'll want to do as many of these as possible leading up to that, which is great because it's like, OK, maybe we'll actually have Alexandra 
kind of consistently in these events. And we will get to see her up against Dezak, you know, event after event rather than just kind of inter- intermittent here and there, here and gone at the next one and whatnot. I, I don't know much about like the, the training cycles for speed climbing at all, but I, I have to imagine she's going to have the ability to compete at the European stops that happen before the world championships. Cause there is almost like a month gap before the world champs. If I remember right, I might have that, like maybe it's only two or three weeks. Um, but uh, I, I hope we do get to see her. Cause again, the streak that I'm excited about is like, there have only been a couple people that have won four speed world cups back to back. Right. And then nobody's done it five times. So like she can do it. She can be that person. And so like for the sake of history, you're like, please, please just show up because, <laughs> you know, the likelihood is crazy that you win so long as you're there. And, and that's like really what I crave. Um, but again, I think I think mentioning like the tension, uh, like you said, Megan, is like going into that speed world championship. If Alexandra has won every single one up to then, like that only adds pressure. Like every time you win one, it just adds more pressure to win the next one. And I think uh, I think that makes for some really compelling just like edgier seat watching when we get to burn that'll be nuts i also feel like i can't imagine the pressure that a dominant speed climber feels right because like obviously there's pressure when you're dominating in general but knowing what you're always gonna do i feel like that has to add so much more like heart racing adrenaline all of that like more so than if you are a boulder lead specialist like I would feel like I have to throw up all the time. I feel like, I don't know. She does it so well. She looks just so focused, so ready. And like, it seems terrifying. <laughs> I, I I just want to tack on like that's kind of a good point that that boulders and lead climbers should should they have this luxury of like oh you know it wasn't my style it wasn't you know all that kind of stuff where speed. Um, yeah. Whereas with speed climbing, it's like, oh, it's 100 percent your fault if this doesn't work out. Like you've practiced this for, you know, in Alexandra's case for like 10, 15 years. So what's your excuse? Um, but yeah, bouldering a bad day or just like, yeah, it wasn't my style today. You know, I'll come back stronger next time or whatever. So, yeah. And, you know, we've seen instances in bowl, even like this event. I think there was one of the problems in the finals where Natalia grabbed it by just like three fingertips, grab the top hold by like yeah. three fingertips. It's like in in boulder and lead climbing, there's a little bit of a margin for error because you can kind of catch yourself and whatnot. And in speed, the margin for error is just so slim. There's, there's nothing. It's like if you have the slightest stumble, the slightest slip, it, and it, we're only talking what, five, six seconds here. So it's just like it, it all can come crashing down and so that plays into continuing this streak just in terms of the odds, the statistics that you won't yeah. mess up is just, I don't know. It just all heightens the tension. And, and I mean, I'm, I'm anxious. I'm nervous watching Alexandra. Same. So I can only imagine what she thinks when she's, she's actually doing the hard, the hard work. I yeah. don't know. It's impressive. Yeah, to especially say the least. like her last like third, I feel like, or quarter of the route is like so aggressive and she stomps every hold and there's like a foot switch in between and you're like how is this even possible i'm terrified you're gonna mess up and she like is perfect <laughs> yeah yeah she would she would kill it in river dance i, I think that'd be <laughs> that'd be a fun one to watch throwbacks throwbacks for all the all the 80s and 90s kids but yeah anyway <laughs> Uh, let's uh, let's go on and talk about winners because I think this will let us like delve a little more uh, into what we've already been talking about. So just because we were talking about it, uh, Megan, I'm going to have you go first to start this one and we can get into the nitty gritty. Okay, so my winner is Natalia Grossman. And I mean, obviously she won the competition, but I feel like I say that more so because I feel like it was a huge win to see her feeling good. Um, she's been having some stomach issues, which have been like, up and down and then on top of that in Seoul she had a really bad fall and like I felt like watching her climb in Seoul was painful like I could feel like the pain that she was going through and you could just tell she like didn't feel good and had no pep in her step so I just felt like it was really nice to see her feeling good again and she was like so smiley and like also then performed really well but just from a health standpoint just good to see her feeling good. She kind of saved her season in a way. I, I mean, in, in terms of the results, in terms of quieting all the questions that everybody had about her. Uh, I, Tyler, you and I were talking. We were kind of like, what's going on with Natalia this year? Uh, uh, you know, and it's like we we didn't quite want to analyze her on previous episodes, analyze her performance, because we 
we kept thinking like, okay, at some point she's going to click into the, the Natalia that we th- expected for this season. I mean, it was, I think in Innsbruck and Seoul, she was eighth place and 11th place, or maybe it was 11th place and eighth place. And I know Seoul was weird because we didn't have the finals because of the rain and stuff, but essentially that that's the first two comps of not even making finals. And, yeah. and that's a precipitous drop compared to where she was last year, which was in the first two or three comps, you know, winning or getting a podium. Um, and so I think everybody knew that something was going on here. Natalia was open about it. I, I think part of what added to the perplexity was she kept citing this stomach issue. And I think it's like, that's not really something that we can all relate to, right? Because I mean, we've all had food poisoning, but to have food poisoning that l- lasts like a year or whatever, it just sounds awful. It's not like a, a, a sprained ankle or a broken limb that you can kind of have a, a point of reference for that. It's 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 more nebulous. And so I think a lot of us are just kind of like, what exactly is the ailment, ailment here? What's going on? It's clearly, uh, you know, maybe playing into the mental game. I don't know, but that just all adds to this win here, meaning so much more, so much more for her, and and I think it meant a lot for her fans. It ended up being a, a great story. Obviously, all of that is secondary to her actually being in a good place mentally and and health wise. So it just, yeah, it, uh, happy to see her back to form and back to the form that we kind of expected her to be in the preseason when we were looking at this upcoming 2023 year. I think, I think you summarize it well is because we had so many like little pieces of information. Um, and so the question was, okay, well, when does this end? Like when, when are you going to be able to compete fully again? Because, you know, we, we hear from, I can't remember which comp it was, but you hear something about food poisoning. But then again, you hear from last year, you hear something about, you, there was the Instagram of her, I think in a hospital, like, you know, in, in a, in a hospital bed. And of course there's always been speculation, frankly, about just her body weight in general. And so there's all these little like pieces where you're like, okay, what is relevant? What is not? Are these connected? And if it's food poisoning, that's a weekend. Or maybe, you know, it's a, an Asia trip and maybe your body's just not used to, to maybe what you're eating out there or the travel is is tweaking you out. So much about your, your you know, gastrointestinal system is related to stress and we're going into a qualification year for the Olympics. And maybe that's, you know, that's something that Natalia hasn't actually gone through as, as hardcore as somebody like Brooke went through, right? Um, she kind of got thrust into that very quickly. Um, So is it going to be something short term? Is it something you can learn how to manage? Or is this like a new reality for you where maybe this year is kind of a write off because you're just confronting these these uh, uh, chronic health problems, which maybe they still are. Like I know a lot of athletes deal with chronic stomach issues and you just try to make sure that you don't have flare ups around the times you're competing. And that's incredibly hard to manage. So I know what I was saying last uh, last time we spoke was, you know, I'm not going to really judge her performance yet um, based off two events. I'd like to see at least one more. And this was like the most convincing possible performance you could have to say, okay, she still has it. Mm-hmm. Now, is she going to be able to stay in that in that uh, in that state in that condition in that good condition for the rest of these comps or is this maybe going to be a, a a regular part of Natalia's story where we say we have like this remarkably talented, unbelievably strong climber just with this weight around her you know chained around her ankle that you know uh, it's it's not up to her when it comes up and really chains her down and knocks her out of finals I have no idea but it was very positive to see her looking like this because she was the favorite going into the season the second we all heard that Yanya was not going to be competing at the first bunch of world cups it's like oh natalia gets the season if she keeps that form and then we were all stunned to see her have two really terrible comps for her so uh it's nice to see that she's back in fighting form because without natalia going into the comps where Yanya is back you're like oh that's even more hollow like is there even a head-to-head at all once Yanya comes back if natalia's not there so it's i'm i'm glad it's coming together yeah, I do think too, like, I mean, it does seem as though this is kind of like something she's going to have to deal with, at least for a while, um, from what I know of the situation. Um, and it is also cool that I feel like these days, like gut health is like such a thing that's talked about. And like, there are these, there's just so many things. And at least now, you know, doctors can figure that stuff out a little sooner. But I feel like this competition, her performing and and not to say she didn't, you know, 
have little moments because I think she mentioned to me something like that happened in ISO and she's starting to get all worried. But clearly, like, she is learning how to handle this. And I think having that performance will like help her for the rest of the season in the sense that like now she knows even if she's not having a good stomach day like she still is capable the same way like as an athlete you have to learn if you wake up kind of sick one day or whatever all these things we go through and learn that we can overcome like this is just her now learning that she can overcome this obstacle that she's dealing with and being tw- uh, 21, 20, yeah, 21 or 22, she is like all of us. I'm sure you guys can relate to this too. There's like, there's parts about being a human being and like your health that for me as like a, a mid 30 something, I'm like, I still don't know how to deal with this, right? Like yeah. this is something I've been coping with since I was a teenager. I still don't know how to cope with it, but I'm getting better at it. I think that's probably really good context. Like you said, like it's something she's going to have to learn more and more about and travel only makes it harder. Like, okay, how yeah. do you, how do you create habits and how do you manage your health when you're in an entirely different environment and all of your resources and your food and everything is like out of your control yeah that's a lot and so uh, it's gonna it's like that's gonna make all of her wins even more impressive and just her struggle as an athlete just like more intense and and panning out from all this five wins in a row in salt lake city i'm trying to think of another competitor who has ruled a a venue or a, a a host location in the in that way i can't think of i'd have to look at the kind of the full results i can't think of anybody off the top of my head that's that's that dominant and undefeated to that Mm -hmm. extent in 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 a particular city let alone you know your hometown it's um really great it was really great and and aside from the results even if she hadn't won i think megan you were kind of alluding to this just seeing her on the mat seeing her climb with such 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 uh confidence seeing her smiling clearly having fun it was just really a, a, a quite a change from what we saw in maybe in Seoul because of the whiplash, the bad fall and all that, and and from Hachioji. So it was just, it, she seemed back in so many ways, not just in terms yeah. of the medal, but also just in terms of her demeanor on the mats. It was great. 100%. Yeah. There Tyler, is... you're you're looking at uh, results. Yeah, Tyler, you're looking at people that have that have won. Yeah, no, I couldn't like it's that's a really hard one to 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 check. But there is one other like there's one other weird city that hosted a lot of comps back to back, which was Yekaterinburg in like Siberia. Um, two years in a row, they hosted three comps like back to back. Um, so in, I think it was 2002 and 2003, um, they, every week was a speed comp. And then a couple of those weeks they added like a boulder comp or a lead comp. And I think one of the years it was a notoriously shit competition. Like, I think they had to like cancel one of the rounds cause the tech delegates were like, these mats are terrible. Like we like for safety, we have to cancel a round of this competition. Um, that was the closest thing I could think of, but just about that stat about like five in a row in the location, like obviously she has the benefit of, you get two events back to back, right? For most yeah. cities like Chamonix that's been going on forever or whatever, um, you don't get two two in a in a year. But I think I think it does beg the question, like at some point we have to talk about like what is it historically about US athletes having such a high win rate at home compared to other countries? Cause it is a little tilted. And I'm I'll I'll do a video about that hopefully this year because it's a little bit like, what what are you guys doing down there? Somebody somebody needs to do an inquiry. Yeah, right? I don't know what's up. <laughs> But yeah, Chris Danielson's behind it somehow. I know some, <laughs> there's something going on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Wouldn't that be interesting? Yeah. Um, John, talk to me. What? Uh, t- oh, go ahead. Yeah. For a quick second, I got to let my dog out. She's yeah, absolutely. Out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. No One second. It's all good. Tyler, I'll, I'll hold off on yeah, for sure. uh, my, my winner. But while we're just killing time here, can, I'm trying to think of somebody else who has won that many... Oh, it's so hard to remember it with that kind of like framework. Like, it's like, okay, did you win this city, this city, this city? Like, that's really tough. That's kind of a a tough one to think about. Yeah, I don't know. I guess a challenge to the listeners or the viewers to try to. Oh, no, I'll I'll find the answer before they do. Don't worry. Don't worry. (laughs) Listeners, listeners aren't involved in this at all. Anyway, that was short enough break. I don't even have to cut this out. So there you go. All the all the all the viewers get to see that whole thing. John, um, winners. What's uh, what's your pick? My winner would be Tomoa Narasaki. He wins in the men's division at Salt Lake City and I think finally gets a win in the United States. I, I or at least a Boulder win. I think this was his first one. I was looking at the results. So he gets this year, obviously, first place. 2022, last year, he was seventh in Salt Lake. 
2021, he was third. Uh, but 2020, you know, that season was a wash. 2019, so we're going back to Vail now. He was second. 2018, and that third. was such that was such a win too. That second in Vail, that was 100 percent a gold medal. He fluffed that, so like that should have been a yeah. gold. Yeah, and and 2018, third. 2017, uh, 2017, he was ninth. 2016, second. And then 2015, he was 31st. And 2014, yeah, he was like 34th. So he's kind of coming tomorrow. up. That's not that really, point. yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah. this was a huge, a huge deal for him to actually finally get a, a, a win on U.S. soil. And what was really cool is I think heading into this season, a lot of us were kind of wondering if maybe we had seen the best of Tomoa, maybe if his better years were behind him. He's 26 years old, which I, I know this is like pretty young, but for, for you know, for Some time. Years. Uh, and and he in Innsbruck at the end of last season he was seventh and then Hachioji this year to kick off this season he was tenth so we were kind of thinking like oh maybe he's sort of dropping out of the final round version of Tomoa that has been so consistent and then yet he comes in Seoul he gets second place and then here in Salt Lake City he gets first place and all of a sudden in the men's division we have this cool little rivalry there in its own right between Tomoa and Mejdi because Mejdi wins the first two comps of this season and he's not here in Salt Lake City. Tomoa had a silver medal in Seoul, as I said, and then he wins here in Salt Lake. So it's like, geez, what's going to happen in, in Prague and in Brixen and in Innsbruck? A lot of intrigue in the men's division too, thanks to Tomoa's win here in Salt Lake. Yeah, that's so true. I also feel like it's cool too because I feel like Serato is also kind of creeping on Tomoa at this point. So him like firmly walking away with that gold just is another sign of, yeah, I'm not done yet. I see you, but <laughs> you're not taking my, you know, leader of the Japanese team title just yet. <laughs> yeah, they you, were you, close you too. They both had the wrong round, kid. You should have saved it. <laughs> yeah. Should have saved a few hours. Yeah. Know, right? That's so true. Right. They both had I, four I, tops yes. in the in the finals, they both they both topped all four boulders, and and it did feel very much like a, a mentor mentee, uh, not yet young Jedi type of thing, which is going to be really fun to track. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be fun to watch them, uh, you know, in the in the comps to come and in the seasons to come. Yeah, I uh, I think this was a really compelling men's field, considering like we're. I'm starting to get used to not seeing people like Jakob Schubert and Adam Andra and like Yerne Kruder was kind of a, a sad one, although like I, I don't really expect him in finals anymore. It's kind of like a nice treat if he does show up, but he had that really cool uh, um, uh, uh, props to is it Paul Higgins. Um, we've emailed in the past about stats and stuff, but he's the new record holder for the most Boulder World Cup participations. Um, and there was a cute little like behind the scenes video where uh, JP Tim Hatch uh, kind of like gave him some plaudits in front of the whole crowd, I guess, in the in the technical briefing. Um, yeah. Uh, but so anyway, like tr I'm try starting to get used to these really big names that have that have been a really big part of finals for a generation and trying to accept like all these young upcomers. And it's much more satisfying when there is somebody like Tomoa that still shows up and and is saying like, yeah, on my best day, I'm still like a force to be reckoned with. And I'm like, I invented modern bouldering kids. So, you know, yeah. buckle up. Um, yeah, I really liked it. And modern speed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I really liked I really liked the spread. Sean Bailey also being the other kind of like, uh, you know, grizzled and, and um, uh, grizzled's not the anyway. Yeah, it just nice to have somebody that's got some experience and also has like a bit of a chip on the shoulder. Like I've been around a long time and I'm not letting you kids take it, take a medal off me. Like, yeah, it was uh, it was a really fun uh, mix of people for finals. Sean had a great, a great final round. It was really that second boulder and really that one move of the second, that dino, which I was nervous about uh, who climbed first, Dikey, I think, in the finals. And as soon as we kind of saw that move, I was thinking, oh, this is this this might be kind of tough for Sean. Um, and I, I, you know, you don't want to play the what if game, but I, being a, such a fan of Sean, I, I'm come away thinking like, gosh, what if Sean had been able to do that dino? Uh, well, on the podium for sure. <laughs> yeah, and mm -hmm. but overall, that not you know, regardless, I think it was a great comp for Sean. It was really talk about someone that shines in in Salt Lake City. Um, so it was awesome to see him kind of 
back in top form as well. Um, and it, I'm intrigued to watch him in Prague and Brixen and on and on. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, fortunate when those movements happen that he gets shut down from. I think we had one at team trials that did this. It's just like that, just like total straight vertical jump, basically, because he is on the shorter side. So in reality, he probably needs to do some more box jumps or something. But it is interesting, though, because I also sometimes think that the root setters forget how small he is the same way I think they forget how small Brooke is sometimes because they're actually like a lot smaller than the rest of the field. Um, but they don't realize that they're that small, you know? So mm-hmm. it's always an interesting thing. It doesn't happen all the time, but occasionally it happens and you're like, oh, dang. He, it, it adds so much to the finals in Salt Lake, though, when Sean is there in the finals, just because he is such a, a superstar there. Uh, it, the crowd just goes crazy for him. It's so great when he is there. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, it just it it adds so much to have him on the roster of one of those six. So he's yeah. one of the mellow squad, right? You can tell you can tell how disconnected I am from modern like outdoor I, climbing media, but I mean, I'm sure they've probably featured him at some point, but I don't yeah. think he's like in it in the same way because most of the okay. guys that are like involved in the whole creation of it are strictly like outdoor. They're not really competing at all, um, but yeah. they do. They feature athletes, right? Like Brooks had some videos. I'm sure Sean, I, I feel like Sean's done some things more recently. Um, I, I, my question was just going to be like, I wonder if if his like uh, cachet as a as a climbing celebrity, when you talk about people like being really hyped for him, I wonder if it's if it's more for outdoor stuff and the media associated with that, or if it's more for like competition mm-hmm. climbing. Because as a as a comp climber, his presence is like a little bit up and down. Like there's yeah. there's a lot of days where he's not there, where he's not showing up in the rounds that have streams and not showing up in finals. Whereas with the outdoor stuff, like it gets talked about a lot more, it gets watched a lot more. More. and of course he's really successful at that stuff too so he might be one of those like him and him and magos are like the crossover artists kind of when it comes to the <laughs> <laughs> the male climbing sort of yeah 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 um yeah for my winner i wanted to and it's not so much talking about like him as a winner but i wanted to talk about how we talk about this climber and that's toby roberts um mm-hmm. toby roberts like that last boulder in men's the the uh like kind of the one moment of typical American bouldering kind of at the end of things uh, that really shook up the order, um, knocked us out of a, what looked like it was going to be a, a triple Japanese podium again. Um, and it ended up rocketing Toby into uh, the bronze medal place. And I think what was, what was curious is we've kind of been talking about him as a lead specialist. And the only foundation for that actually is the fact that on uh, before this weekend, he has competed in a total of four World Cups. Two of them were Boulder, two of them were lead. He happened to get a bronze medal in the lead competition. Um, but now he follows it up in his third Boulder World Cup ever with a bronze medal as well. And so when we look at like the big picture of things, you've got three Boulder World Cups in total, two lead World Cups in total. He's earned a bronze in both. He's made semis in both. When he did the combined World Cup, the uh, and when I say combined, I mean like Boulder and lead last year, um, his bouldering and lead in terms of like placing was approximately like uh, at parity. I think in the qualifying round, he did better in lead, but in the semifinal round, he did better in bouldering. So I think the the lead specialist thing that all three of us probably have, have remarked about in the past is like, oh, it was probably a little bit premature to kind of like pigeonhole him into being a lead specialist because he's done so little international comps and of the comps he's done, he's actually done kind of equally well in both of them. So I think this is a huge win for him, not just showing that, hey, Britain, somehow Britain's got a medalist again that can do both disciplines, which is crazy. Um, John, I saw you and Natalie Berry talking on Twitter about like, when was the last time that the UK had a candidate for someone that could medal in both disciplines, right? Um, and like Shauna was kind of the closest that you could really get to, but she never earned a, a, a lead medal, I don't think, if, I, if I'm remembering right off the top of my head. Um, so yeah, that's a really huge deal. And especially in this given year, I think that was a, a huge win for him. It's crazy that we got to talk about men's British, British climbing being like possibly super relevant. Um, these last couple of years have really shaken that narrative up. So that's super cool. Yeah. I feel like nowadays, even like calling anyone a specialist in either mm. leader or like it's becoming less of a thing because the people that are on top in one are generally on top in the other. Mm-hmm. Um, but definitely cool to see a younger athlete with less experience 
Um, yeah, born on... 2005. When I read that, I, I was like, what the <laughs> hell is, is going on? <laughs> and I mean, he looks like, I mean, he looks like he could be 15 or like sure, uh, 13 yeah. years old, honestly. Like he yeah. looks like a baby. So, um, yeah, having that success early on in both disciplines, I think is super cool, but obviously like kind of a testament to how the sport is growing and how the youth side of it has evolved so much and how a lot of those athletes coming into the circuit or the senior circuit or whatever um, are better prepared in both disciplines specifically to do really well quite early on. Yeah, it's kind of you run into the same problem nowadays when we're talking about someone like a Che Yun So or someone like a Brooke Rabatou, which I know we've called them lead specialists in the past. And maybe they were more credentialed in lead than, than Toby was just because especially Brooke has been on the circuit for longer. But you get you know, they're making they're they're having high places in bouldering competitions. In the case of Brooke Rabatou, she's winning a gold medal in a in a bouldering World Cup. So you're like, yeah, it's probably not fair to think of this person as a a lead specialist anymore in the case of Toby. I, I think some of it is due to Matt groom on the live stream. I think Matt called him a lead specialist and Matt also about it. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And Matt mentioned that he had known Toby since Toby was really little. So I think maybe Matt knew the predilections of, of Toby, maybe not necessarily in terms of, comp results but just in terms of what toby preferred and what kind of climbing he really started off doing and stuff maybe matt had some insight that it was maybe lead climbing was that would be really fair context if it was so if if he's got that information i think that's totally fair game um and i guess what these kind of results show is like oh you know we maybe have to leave that kind of narrative from his from his youth days behind based on what we're seeing now and I think he was also referencing like having filmed him or done an interview with him like outside at like a cliff when he was like lead climbing outside or something too. So I do think it was more of a just knowing more about Toby's situation than necessarily thinking he is a lead specialist. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. totally. And, and for the record, I think I was really struggling to find a British man that had come even close to getting a medal in both disciplines. I, I think it was the best I could come up with was Malcolm Smith, who who placed 10th in a lead comp World Cup in 1991. And then like 11 years later, got a medal. Uh, won, I think he might have won. Good, or, good or find, by the way. I'm World surprised. Yeah, I'm surprised you found that one because there's like it is odd how many people like the other the other like famous one is Olga Bibic who did the cross discipline thing but it was from 93 to what 2002 she like as a 16 year old she wins a speed like event uh in like 93 or whatever and then 10 years later like wins boulder events when Sandrine LeVay is not around it's like wait what like what you switch disciplines like t- I, anyway yeah those those were all I'm really that was a good find John well and I, th- I was sure it was going to be Ben Moon because I just figured he he invented the moon board. He's probably yeah, sure. he's probably medaled in a bouldering yeah. world cup, right? But no. Well, you, you realize like how late the bouldering world cups even exactly. started. So all yeah, those guys exactly. in their heyday, they just didn't happen. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's exactly right. He medaled in a lead cup, but never. I I don't even think bouldering was a thing back then. So uh, I mean, a, a thing in terms of the <laughs> world cup. So uh, so yeah, it, it wasn't Ben Moon. That was who I would have placed my money on. But nope. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Um, let me let me start the losers category because um, mine's like not super athlete related, and it comes with a bunch of winners as well. So it's kind of it's kind of a soft losers for uh, for the week. Um, but I wanted to talk about the commentary because I think there were some highlights, and then there's for me a particular low light. But first, and I'm just gonna I just dump praise on you, John. I we haven't talked about this, but I really liked. Uh, the chemistry between yourself and Matt, uh, Megan, I thought you guys were excellent. And I think um, we, we always, we only ever get the opportunity to talk about like, Oh, this athlete, you know, was really good with Matt and this athlete, because we never know who's going to be on commentary. It's based on like who doesn't make it into the round and, and the athletes bring like a particular strong suit if you're lucky. Um, But they usually don't bring the same refinement and confidence in being somebody whose job it is to talk about what's going on. Um, and I thought you nailed it. Like you have just had a bunch of years of experience. You just keep getting better. And I thought the two of you really gelled 
really, really well. I loved it. I thought it was coherent in terms of like the sense of humor and the back and forth. I didn't feel like you guys were stepping on each other's toes. It seemed like you were both happy with how it went from 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 just uh, from what I heard. So I loved it. I thought it was great. Um, what I'm sad for is my friend Pete Woods. Um, you know, that's the the sad thing. And, and this is a very selfish topic in a way. And Pete knows the struggle the same way I do. Um, but yeah, it's... Uh, from from the perspective of somebody who likes doing commentary and uh, enjoys like being involved in broadcasts and, and is passionate about like how we tell the stories, it's hard because this is an industry of, of basically like one person at a time, right? Right now it's Matt, before it was Charlie, before it was, you know, whoever you wanna go back to. And so if you're interested in this and if you wanna be good at it, it's very hard to get a break because in our system, there's a, you know, a single commentator and then whoever the guest is. And so I got, I probably like got my hopes up when I saw that Pete got the US World Cups for the last couple of years, because that made me think, oh, maybe we're moving towards a sport where we get multiple different voices that change based on, you know, in, in that case, it was geographically where, okay, now we're gonna have a North American voice. Um, or maybe it would have been discipline wise. Maybe we've got lead voices and bouldering voices and speed voices, which I think would be like really relevant. That's not a knock on anybody, but like speed is so different. Like that's a, a great discipline to have a, a, a separate set of voices. So I think I got overhyped. Like maybe there's going to be a bunch of people that have excellent, but differing voices in the broadcasts. Um, and so I was really disappointed when Pete told me he wasn't going to be involved in, in Salt Lake this year, because that is kind of the path that I again, selfishly, kind of wish commentary and climbing would go. So I was really sad when it turned out not to work out for him. Um, I thought the broadcast was still excellent, but for people like me and Pete, it's like, ah, damn, you know, the, the, it's much harder to, to now get to where we wanted to go with one of the things we're passionate about. So that's my loser is the commentary model seems to be moving away from the direction that I kind of hoped it would go. I know I was super surprised too when I found out, cause he texted me and he said he wasn't commentating. And I was like, oh, Wait, what? I was like so, so confused. Um, yeah, I, I, it's interesting though because I I've heard that they kind of want to push more towards multiple commentators in different locations. Like they've been talking about that for the last couple of years, and that about that being the direction they wanted to go. So I mean, I guess only time will tell what really happens. But I I agree. I think you know it's nice to have more voices. Also, like. Also investing in two commentators commentators versus having an athlete come in because it's it's kind of an in interesting model in that way because you have someone that hopefully isn't too bummed and like happy to be there because you're only coming in because you didn't make a round, which is like in and of itself kind of awkward. <laughs> and then on top of that, it's it's is that person comfortable uh, on the mic? How, how how is their English? Like, there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes with that, and it makes it kind of just a inconsistent model. So it'd be cool if they did invest in two commentators and then also, like, switching them around. I think that would be cool. But I'm glad you did like the broadcast. I had fun. It felt really fluid and honestly pretty easy, <laughs> which yeah, I think. I said that to Robin. She was like, how was the first day? And I was like, yeah, I don't know. This just seems easy now, which I don't know if that's a bad thing, but it's nice. I used to get so nervous and now I'm like, I'm just going to talk. It'll be fine. <laughs> no, that's like, that's, that's what I wanted to say is like, there is something I'm, I'm learning is it's really difficult to sit in front of a camera and speak as yourself. Um, mm -hmm. I've spent all these years doing commentary and even like doing some of these videos. I'm like, oh, this, that's not actually me. When I watch it back, I'm like, I'm trying to be somebody else or whatever. And so I'm realizing like how difficult that is to do. Um, it, you sounded natural and you sound smooth. And of course, Matt is already there. I don't know what it is with the British and they just have this on camera <laughs> charisma. It's like their national like commodity or whatever. Um, it's crazy, um, but it sounded easy and not, not in a bad way, like you're phoning it in. It sounded like you guys were just like comfortable and you fit together and you can't fake chemistry and it sounded really good. Yeah, and we had like literally maybe a 10 minute meeting the day before, like during qualifiers, just kind of talking through everything. And it was so nice to quickly, like I noticed right away we were so on the same page about like the flow of everything. And I think that's something you learn over time is it's, it is like a less is more kind of thing. You don't need to be stepping over each other. There's plenty of time to talk. We don't need to overfill like, and then once you're comfortable with that, I think it is just easy to find a flow. 
Yeah, a hundred percent. I wanted to, John. I just wanted to like to get a little bit of context, and from both of you, because you're both probably, um, you know, Megan, you've been an ESPN employee, lit- I think literally. So you also have some great context with this. Um, but like, I don't watch a ton of other sports, but the stuff that I do watch, um, you know, you'll have uh, different commentators based on like the team, right? Or or. Uh, just based on where the comp is but i i'm curious if you think that's actually something that is obviously more valuable like i know there's there's something nice about hey it's always jim nance at the masters there's something Mm -hmm. like there's something nice about that it's so it's a familiar voice you can't not like him kind of uh but it's also nice when i'm watching like counter-strike i don't know who the commentators are going to be but i know whoever it is they follow every game they're extremely passionate it's not like they take a vacation and don't watch the comps that they don't commentate they're always watching so whoever the voices are it's just a nice change up you always know it's going to be good and i really like that so i don't know if you guys had any thoughts on like which is actually better or not um yeah i i guess my it's probably all a lot based on personal preference but i definitely enjoy having a stable commentator a a familiar face it it feels like you're returning to an old friend right when you when you go back the next season and it's the same commentator i think that's part of the reason why it was so sad when when charlie bosco left because it, it was like oh this guy is the voice of world cups and i know we had some other people in there that were great too like mike langley and whatnot i really liked uh, some of the stuff that that all, a lot of the other kind of guest commentators added. But yeah, Charlie was the guy and then he leaves and it's really sad. Now Matt is is kind of, he's becoming that guy and I, I like that he's he's becoming the voice. I, M- Megan I now consider to be the voice of U.S. Nationals and team trials and stuff mm-hmm. because you've been at it now for several years, Megan, and, and, and now the voice of the Salt Lake City World Cups and stuff. Um, so... Yeah, I'm definitely a big fan of having the same people back year after year, comp after comp. I I really like that. And I completely disagree. And I know I like it's one of those (laughs) things where like I I completely agree with you. And my opinion is partially selfish, but also like if all the commentators are good, I like having that spread, you know, like I, I think everybody that's involved with it is great. But there's a part of me that's like. Wouldn't it be fun to have like fucking Brian Runnels back to like do a round of commentary? How funny would that be? Like what a what a great throwback, you know, just like mix it up here and there. I think it's I think it's just fun that way. Wait, I have thoughts on all of this. I have to let my dog in. So yeah, I no like worries. It. It's all good. <laughs> I, okay, this is opening up all. I, I, this is broadening into a much uh, a much larger discussion here, and I want to get some of Megan's thoughts. But when you're talking about bringing, when you're talking about bringing athletes in for guest to be guest commentators and whatnot. Something that I really like that they've done at U S nationals these past couple years is they'll bring in an athlete like Emma hunt or somebody, but it's just, it's, it's for like just five minutes or, you know, it's, it's just sort of a brief appearance. You get a little of unique insight and then it goes back to the professional commentators and the people that, you know, I really like that usage of an athlete as a guest commentator rather than, Having an athlete who's whatever, you know, 18 years old and does not have much experience behind a camera or behind a microphone and saying, okay, here, you have to commentate now for two and a half hours. Like, that's a huge, that's a really big ask for anybody, let alone somebody that's not experienced doing it. Yeah, I like that you brought that up because I love our model that we use as well. Like, I love bringing the athletes in. It's super fun, first of all, to see who wants to join because they're actually not always, like, chomping at the bit to get in the booth with us. But also um, just seeing how they do. Like, for example, I had Sam Watson in the booth with me for a little bit of speed at Team Trials, and he was awesome. He did amazing. I thought it was really cool, and I, like, can't wait to have him back in there again. And, you know, like you were saying about speed – It is different than the other disciplines and hearing the insight that he has as like such an incredible speed athlete is really cool to have as an addition to the broadcast. Um, It's hard because like selfishly, I obviously want to keep doing my job. So I guess if they started trying to swap me out, I wouldn't necessarily be psyched. Um, because I do think it is good to have like one person that's always there and then maybe swap out the second person a little bit here and there. Um, I feel like I'm in an interesting position because I started as a color commentator, but I've also taken on the lead commentator role so I can kind of do both jobs and I'm fine doing both jobs. And so I don't know if everyone is that way. So, I mean, actually it's 
they're not because, for example, someone like Matt is the lead commentator. He's not really there for color. Um, yes, he's a climber, but he doesn't have the actual experience of being in the competition. Mm-hmm. Same with Pete. I mean, Pete did comps way back in the day, but I wouldn't say enough of them to also take on that color commentator role. So it is interesting because when you start to do both jobs, then it's like, I don't know, and you have to go back and forth. But yeah, I, I do think one stable commentator and then maybe bringing in someone else here and there, I think is cool just to have another voice and have another style, I would say. But also, it's just hard because there's only so many comps a year <laughs> in general. Mm-hmm. And- We'll have to make money. And, so. and I'll, I'll, I'll just like, I'll just go, you know, like a hundred years in the future because I know it's not going to happen anytime soon. Um, but there's, there is, you know, there's room for uh, like more opportunities for different voices in a broadcast if you have the money for it. Right. Okay. So, you know, at the moment, it, it, fortunately, it's somebody like you for this event, but otherwise it is not only is it some random athlete commentating for a full couple hours of semifinals, but they're also the person that all of a sudden that has to be an interviewer with somebody who they may have never spoken to before and may speak an entirely different language. And do you know how to handle a mic when an, when a, a, an interpreter is like a, is involved? Um, there's space for the interviewer. There's space for analysis. Like I've actually, this is really kind of silly, but I've actually really enjoyed the last couple comps where after the athlete interview has happened and then there's just some time before the podium Matt is just left there by himself on the mic while the video like the camera's just doing whatever and he's just left there to muse about like life and whatever else is going on in the universe and it's so charming just listening to him just like talk and make little quips about this and that but there's a that's a five minute window right there to have three experienced and varied voices break down the climbing from a different perspective. You get a change of voices and you talk about, okay, what were the like the best things that went on during this event? What were the highlights? Why was this so impressive? And so there's space for analysis or like there's space for analysts. There's space for interviewers. There's even space for like a host character, which Matt is already like, he should do that job in addition to commentary if it comes up. So I think there is room. It is always down to a money thing, but I think the summary from this is, um, me, the person that doesn't have a commentary job, wants more voices involved. Megan, who has that commentary job, wants to keep me out as, as long as she can. <laughs> but no, I no, think... Uh, <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm happy to bring in more people. I just want to keep doing my job. Yeah, too, no, that's exactly. All. That's what I'm saying. If it's between the two of you, I know you're going to pick you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, yeah. That's a good point, though, because that's in other sports. That's how it is. You have, like, your two commentators. You have, like, multiple interviewers. Like... The person's not running from the box down to the football field. Like that's literally like when we do our broadcast with ESPN, like that's what I do. I literally run yeah. from the box, go to the interview, run back. Like that's not happening in these sports that make like multi-million billion dollars a year, whatever. Right. It's, it all does come down to money. And if we had more, it'd be cool to have more voices. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I think the last thing I'll say is you mentioned that maybe the IFSC has intent of of trying to like add more voices. I'm not sure how that's going to pan out. My understanding with Pete is that like, it wasn't a scheduling issue. It was kind of a choice to, to get Matt to do the Salt Lake city events this year. So if that is their intent, it's kind of like, they're going to have to prove it, I guess. Cause it looks like Matt's at the moment on schedule to do the rest of the season. So I hope that's what they plan on doing, but based on like the decision this year, I'm like, I'm not super convinced. We'll see what happens, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I agree for this year. Like, that's not the plan. But I think in the future, it's just like a conversation slash seems to be what they want to do. Sure. Fair like, enough. I don't know how it's all going to play out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. OK, let's let's move on to some other people's losers. Um, John, do you want to do you want to go first on this one? And then we can end with Megan's or we'll just see what happens. Sure. Yeah, I feel like we've been doing like the, sort of the 10,000 foot view. And now we're going to like funnel down <laughs> to just one competitor. <laughs> just pick but, on a particular person. Yeah, that's how we do yeah, it. Let's go. Um, you know, I when I was thinking about who to choose as the loser, I, I was thinking, OK, well, who had the most to gain? and therefore the most to lose from this competition. And I came up with Fanny Gibert, mm. who on the one hand, it was, I mean, a, a, you know, longtime fan of hers, as most people are that have watched the circuit forever. So it was so exciting to see her back in a final. Uh, but on the other hand, like you're thinking about what, wow, what a story this would be if Fanny could actually win the gold medal. She's widely cited as, the best competitor 
to never have won a gold medal, right? Uh, most people would agree that she's, if not, if not the competitor, like she's certainly up there. Um, and so it would have just been this great story. And on top of that, I think most people are kind of thinking she's probably at the tail end of her career again, going by comp age. Right. Um, so it felt like kind of a bonus that she ended up like in this final. I, I don't think a lot of people were expecting that necessarily. Uh, I think the, the last time she made a finals was Vale in 2019, actually. So it'd been several years. And then with her, there was all that drama too with, remember she, everybody kind of thought that she had a shot at becoming one of the Tokyo Olympians, but then all of a sudden France gave its other spot to, I, th I think Julia Shannon D got the first spot. And then Anna Jobert got the second spot through the tri tripartite selection. And so everybody was kind of like, ah, oh, what? Like Fanny should have a chance to actually fight for this second spot. And she didn't. So there was just all of that too, that plays into this, how it would be this awesome thing. And then she, she didn't end up, of course, didn't end up getting on the podium, didn't end up winning the gold medal, obviously. It would have been a fantastic story. So she's probably, I'd put her as the loser, but I, I, I did just really love seeing her in the finals. It was still awesome to have her back there. Yeah, it was definitely cool to see her in the final and and to watch her have like a good semis round and really have to like fight for the boulders. That was pretty fun to see. But yeah, I agree. It must be hard having come so close so many times in the past, but still never getting a gold medal. And then, like you said, you know, possibly nearing the end of her competition career in the next like I don't know, few years or so. I mean, we don't really see a lot of athletes staying in for as long, although cool to see Jane Kim back. That was awesome. I was super inspired by that. I thought that that was incredible. So then again, who knows, like maybe yeah. Fanny, her best days are still ahead of her. So great start to getting back in the final. And then hopefully we see her get a shot at the gold at some point again. Yeah, it did kind of cause me to have to recalibrate how I think about her and her career and where she's at in her career, because I, I don't think she probably would have been at the top of my list in terms of Olympians likely to qualify for the 2024 Olympics. I know talking about Olympics is like this whole different discussion, but, uh, you know, you probably think, OK, Oriane for sure, like you have to put her name in the mix. But the fact that Fanny made a finals here, you think, well, yeah, gosh, maybe Fanny could qualify for 2024. And that would be an awesome story in and of itself. So um, so it, it ended up being a good story nonetheless. But uh, it would have been just so cool if Fanny would have gotten that, you know, gotten on the podium yeah. again and, and would have been nice to see her up there. Well, and she qualified so high, too. So, like, it yeah. really did give you hope that it could happen. Yeah. I, I was going to say, like, I out of qualifiers – because uh, so Megan kind of mentioned that qualifiers was like maybe a little too easy like it was interesting because pretty much all the people that got to semis was like yeah that's who's supposed to go to semifinals but there were so many flashes through all the boulders that the the margin for error to be in like the top five or the top 10 after qualifiers was like really really high and so based on kind of luck we got some weird names being like top 10 out of qualifiers so my um, uh, what I would have tweeted if, if I wasn't on like a personal tweet cooldown, um, was just, there was a bunch of names that were ranked really high in qualifiers who is just like guaranteed to fall off. And I was like, there's no way this is actually indicative of your, of your form. And so like Fanny was one of them. Toby Roberts was another. So there's the two that I took the huge L on thinking like, <laughs> yeah, this, they're going to get creamed in semifinals and it's all going to be over. But other names like Ross Fulkerson, I thought like was way too high. Um, Evgenia Kazbakova was too high. Oceana McKenzie was too high. And so for most of those, like they obviously didn't make finals. And the fact that like they could say, yeah, in qualifiers, I flashed like four boulders. It's like, well, maybe that's not so impressive at this competition. But <laughs> I, I think the counter, John, for me is just like for Fanny, making a finals at, at this point is actually a highlight when you compare it to like her record over the last couple of years, like this was a good comp for her. Um, and I don't think in this kind of field, she's like her chances of winning just based on her like past performance are personally just so low in terms of probability that the, so rarely comes up um, again. Like the last time she was really fighting for those medals was really 2019, which is an entirely different field of people. Um, we talk about the 2019 women's bouldering season as being one of the weirdest sets of finalists in terms of one crazy dominant person and, and a bunch of old veterans that were falling off. 
Um, so yeah, I think I think I would almost frame Fanny's performance as a win this time around, to be honest. Like, this is a great result for her. I wouldn't expect much more. She's getting killer ranking points and she's proving that she's in shape to maybe be somebody that like, she could get a top 10 bouldering performance. And then if you get like a, another top 10 lead performance, you become a, like a true contender to be at the Olympics. That's huge for somebody that's going to be like, prob- I think 31 by the time of, uh, or not, not 31. She turns 30 this year. Pardon me. Um, so if she does get to the Olympics, she would be like 31 at that point. That's huge. That is huge. Yeah. It's funny. I was making a list of potential winners or uh, winner people that I could put on my winners list and I did have Fanny on there and, yeah. and so I think that that just speaks to yeah it's kind of she could go either way depending on how you want to analyze her performance you could say she had a lot to lose here but then you could also say it was a great it was just great seeing her uh in the in the finals and I could be persuaded either way for sure yeah 100 percent Megan let's uh let's finish this off what was your loser from uh, Salt Lake oh yeah so my loser from Salt Lake was just the judging technical that happened with Serato on men's number one. Um, I, you know, it's funny too, because as I was watching him climb, I kept thinking to myself, I just don't feel like he started this right. But then nothing happened. And I was like, huh, am I crazy? Like, is the sun getting to me? Like, did I see this wrong? And then he started again. And then I was like, well, I feel like he's never established, but nobody's saying anything. So I just didn't say anything. And then later the appeal happens and I'm like, oh, okay, so I'm not crazy. But it seems bizarre that they let him start that many times and didn't say anything. And I know that obviously, like, nobody's perfect. So, like, judges make mistakes too. But when it comes, I I almost felt like, and I know this isn't the first time we've seen this. I think this happened to Colin Duffy as well um, last season. And But I do almost feel like there should be some sort of rule that's different for – establishing versus you know control of the top or the zone because to let an athlete continuously try for their entire time and then they come out and they get like two minutes left I I don't know there was just something about it that felt like the mistake is so on the judge and like so not on the athlete and it frustrated me it can feel really unfair when you just let a climber yeah. burn out on attempts and then you're like, oh, actually none of it counted and you have to do it again. Like, I, I, I totally know what you mean by that. Yeah, yeah. it is. And just talking about like it is you, you mentioned like the, the rules. It is crazy that we already have like three. And I, I understand why Matt like occasionally gets confused on on which is which. But like for finish, it's control for um, for bonus, it's use. And for the start, it's like stable or stability. Yeah, stable and it's like a completely like completely different set of like criteria. For, for judging like is that a valid contact with the holds yeah if I'm remembering right for and the, the one reason I feel like like a little bit iffy about commenting on this is just because I didn't go back and watch like all of the climbers like starts to see if if they were all like approximately the same and we're just kind of like you know um um trying to like separate hairs or whatever um but yeah he basically had like two point there was a it was a three point hold and a one point hold am I remembering that right it it was a it was a one one and a two I think or oh no you're right it was a three yeah and a three one. three on the bottom one on the right and he basically had two he never stopped or something yeah he had two on the left side and then he would bring up the other foot but as the other foot came up to establish three his hand would come off it so yeah. if there was a moment where he had three points it was just a split second right um, yeah so it sounds like the the Americans like filed an appeal against that one so it it, it I don't I think them for final i mean you're, that's mm-hmm. what you're supposed to do right but like i guess i was just so baffled that in that four minutes of climbing the judges never said anything about it I, it was just i don't know it was just disappointing <laughs> yeah that's and that's where i'm kind of like uh unsure because maybe maybe if we go back to watch and we just say because that's like one of those starts where the, the starting position is like stable enough where the athletes can like start to blow it off and they start Mm. the starting position so quickly because it is easy like it's not like Collins one right that you mentioned from last year where it was actually very difficult to establish for and that's where the discrepancy was with this mm-hmm. one it was pretty easy and so they were just kind of blowing it off and and tapping quickly and and going and so I'm like okay were there multiple climbers that did the same thing and so the judges just kind of like 
started to like let that zone out a little bit. Um, but, and I mean, I think I imagine all three of us have been a Boulder judge at at least one competition in our life and it's freaking brutal to stay focused. Honestly, like it's impossible, man. Yeah. No, it's so stressful. Like yeah. I, when I volunteer for competitions like that, I, I will judge if like you're really in a bind and you yeah. need somebody who knows the rules, but like, it's the last thing I want to do. Mm -hmm. Granted though, at these comps you have IFSC official judges. Yeah. So that's like, totally different thing than like a volunteer judge which makes it even and not 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 trying to come for the judges like we need them too and like it is a job that's necessary and i'm thankful for them but that's the thing it's like they take the pressure off the climber because because okay so for example this I is sorry real quick this is a thing john you and i should do this anytime somebody breaks we should do like a jerry springer thing where we're like now let's bring out the father and <laughs> and bring the official out and just let them like <laughs> fight it out yeah right I have to deal with it no um but I've competed in a competition before where like the judges literally have no idea what's happening and as an athlete the last thing you want to do like I remember finishing a boulder and like it was a balancing match at the end and like knowing for sure that I I like it was it was close but like I for sure had no control judge gave it to me but I was like no I'm gonna climb it again but you should never have to do that like the judge is the one that's supposed to keep you in check and so you can just focus on the climbing because honestly, there's so much going on. You only have a certain amount of time. So you shouldn't have to be worrying about that. Yeah, real crisis averted here, I think, for the IFSC, because fortunately, this did end up being a competition that or a boulder, I should say, that was Serato had it pretty dialed in. It wasn't like a low percentage move, at least for someone of his caliber. Right. Like if this had been, though, like a just a. A sort of Hail Mary type of dino that he just happened to get on that one attempt that was deemed uh, with an illegal start. I'm, I'm looking at the scores here. So if he hadn't have gotten that that any points for that boulder, he would have ended with... So Tomoa wins with four tops. Serato had four tops too, but if one of those had been deemed illegal and he hadn't been able to stick it again, he would have had three tops, whereas Toby Roberts had three tops in a zone. So that would have been a difference in a, in a medal place. And... If he, if you know, if the what if of if he had been called back to do it and hadn't been able to do that move, if it had just been really something really wild. So yeah, I even said that on the live stream because like that would have been so detrimental. Like, luckily it was a slab and he he knew exactly what he needed to do. It wasn't super tricky and he had already done it fairly easily before. So yeah. definitely able to do it again. But yeah, if it was anything else, it could have been a disaster. And I kind of had the same reaction as you did, Megan. When I was watching it, I was like, wait, was that, was that as legal? Like, I'm not sure. You guys and then have I sharper didn't... eyes than when I watched these. Like, I'm never the first person to get, it's like, it's always people just chatting in the discord being like, no, I don't know if I would have given that to them. And I'm like, wait, what? And I got to rewind and stuff. But when I'm watching like a stream, I never catch that stuff. I legitimately thought I was going crazy. I was like, what is <laughs> well, happening? This can't be right. <laughs> And the fact that he didn't get called down, I just kind of figured, oh, it's OK. I, I mean, I wonder if there could be some sort of rule where you want to reward at the end of the day. You want to sort of give the the benefit to the competitor, I think. And yeah. so I'm wondering if a rule could be if a competitor climbs an illegal start. I'm just kind of riffing here, but OK, it's an illegal start. But the judge allows the competitor to go past the zone without calling him down, then maybe it's like the, the call is, the, the climb is allowed to stand. Maybe it's it's almost like there's a... Yeah, that's kind of what I was kind of suggesting too, because I was like, the appeal to me, it feels like annoying that it goes towards the athlete. It seems like this is the judge's fault because they allowed them to continue to climb. It's like their job to pull them off the wall. So yeah, if there was some caveat to the rule, like if you let them climb past the zone, like you're saying, that would be yeah. a great... Now Wait. I'm just imagining like sneaky boulders, like intentionally not starting properly and just like trying to race up past the zone. <laughs> like, looking the behind zone them, just like, you can't, you can't pull me off. I'm past it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I want to actually, because we're talking about this, I want to bring up like the other kind of like, it, I don't think it was really a judging issue, although it sounds like an appeal was filed, but it was women's one. Uh, is it, was it women's one? Uh, women's one. And I've got a picture right here. Let me just bring it up real quick. Not this. Okay, yeah, not this one. Literally yes. this one. Literally this one. <laughs> so women's number one. And it was so funny because uh, in the online observation, so the 3D model of this that they showed before the boulder, the zone was actually originally in a different spot. So if you see yeah, here, the zone is on the gray triangle. And previously, 
before the round, the setters had put the zone on the first of the big round uh, um, uh, slopers, dishes, what they're called UFOs. Um, so they actually changed where the zone was. And I think they changed it for the worse, actually, because first of all, it's way easier to judge a zone on something that's in cut where the climber can clearly actually pull on it and use it and, and create some movement by using it. But they moved the zone down to a flat surface that's pointing downwards. So you're just trying to like, like the climbers are all acting, trying to be like, oh yeah, I'm touching it and moving my foot. Like this counts as use, right guys? But what made it so sad was that you could have put that zone on either of those two holes. It wouldn't have affected the separation at all. Like I think they moved it down because they were like, oh, if you get to this, this big first UFO, the rest of the climb is easy. So we got to like move it down a little bit to make it a little bit tougher to separate, but it would have had no effect. And so that was kind of a bummer because that was such an unusual like it was such an that's one of the zones where I blame the root setters if there's a judging problem on on a zone like that because the boulder is set in a way where it's just so hard to demonstrate or like to to uh, fulfill the requirement of using a zone to like say you're using that hold with your hand nobody has to use that hold with their hand so to me that was a root setting failure whereas Megan for the one you talk about with Serato that is definitely a, well it's kind of a combination of judging and athlete but mostly a judging error for what we're talking about um, yeah so anyway that that might have been the boulder I think there was a boulder that Megan and and Matt commented on oh yeah you guys mentioned it yeah have been yeah. Moved up. Yeah, yeah I think that was yeah. the one uh, they also took Took off. There was a screw on on the first gray volume. There, there used to be two, and they took one off. There was mm. just one for the actual climb. Um, yeah, always the last minute changes. <laughs> yeah, and they always get you, man. That's why I, you know what? My, the first root setter that I ever worked for. Whenever we would do a comp, all of us like junior root setters were like, "No, man, like we're going into finals. We got to change this. Like this guy's too strong. He's gonna crush this." And the head root setter was just like almost despondent, but he was mm -hmm. right every single time. He was just like, "Don't doubt yourself, guys. Just lock it in, and we're just gonna cruise with it." And it made me realize like sometimes you just can't make changes. Not that I have yeah. any experience at an IFSC level. That was for like a youth local like ten years ago. Not at all relevant. But the the <laughs> lesson applies. Sometimes you just don't need to change anything. But uh, yeah, um, did you guys? have any final uh final little shout outs or like little individual call outs for winners losers anything like that the one i wanted to make was of course to madison fisher who uh who ended in eighth place big highlight for canadian bouldering she was kind of the star last year as well i think too uh no she she made semis last year in myringen oh. where she finished ninth so so okay. uh, actually well, it's a two really close finishes yeah yeah, yeah. So. and and uh, what i'm what i'm actually worried about is is at the moment, we have two extra or two additional quota places for the for the Canadian women. It's because of Alana's performance last year and Thank Madison's you. performance last year. Alana Yip, like not looking that great so far. And so I'm concerned that Maddie might be the one carrying us to like get that extra spot on the Canadian bouldering team. But um, oh, yeah. huge performance. Really happy. I hope she's excited about it. I hope she carries that into the European Cups too. Yeah, she looked great. I mean, I guess I already me mentioned Jane Kim for like a second, but mm -hmm. I do think it's really cool to see her back on the circuit, especially because, you know, we've had so many veterans kind of drop off um, and I'm not sure if they have any intention of coming back, but seeing her coming back, I think is super cool. And obviously I think she's plenty capable of, you know, qualifying for the Olympics. So I really hope to see that happen. I think that would be sick. Yeah, it's great to see her back. I, I guess, um, a great another great showing for Annie Sanders who just it's it, we're like seeing her develop in real time in terms of her results her performance she just seems to be getting better and better I remember at the uh, the previous episode Tyler we were saying do you think Annie gets on a podium this year or not and it was kind of like yeah maybe and she almost did it that this I don't know if we thought she'd do it that quickly but uh so that was great um I guess get well soon Kiro Mal because it seems like he has some kind of nasty toe or toenail injury or something I hope it's not too serious because obviously we want him in in the speed world cup so he can go against vedrick and kind of you know push closer to that to maybe snagging the world record and it was a great it was a great comp for kiramal other than the injury it was his first time going sub five in a competition yeah. I, I believe so um yeah unfortunate that that's kind of how it ended i guess he still got a bronze medal which was cool. i know i'm i'm i actually don't know if it was his toe or his toenail but i feel like if it was the nail that would be like easier to recover from, right? Like I would guess. 
right? Yeah, and I then, mean, rather than like a broken toe or something. Yeah, would take... yeah. I I ripped my I ripped my big toenail out on my foot when I was five years old, and I've never recovered, guys. So I don't know. I don't know how he's gonna how he's gonna manage. <laughs> Did it grow back? Uh, it's really messed up. Yeah, it's like it uh, it doesn't grow normally anymore. It hasn't affected my life like at all since then. It was just very traumatic for being five years old. Yeah, let's see it. Come on, show it on. All right, here we go. This is the only fan segment. Of, no, I'm not. I'm not taking. Oh my it. god. <laughs> let's see your nasty gnarled toe. Oh my gosh. Also, I do think. Um, I do think. Shout out to the U.S. men in general. Right, four men into the semifinal. Previous to this comp, only Sean making it into the semifinal, kind of a slow start for the men. So I think a positive showing and hopefully something that they can carry through the rest of the season as well. Well said. Yeah, absolutely. That's something John's been ribbing on this year is is the U.S. men have like not had some not haven't been looking as good before. And I mean, Colin Duffy is another one where we hope to see him at the heights that we saw last year as well. Um, but anyway, yeah, I think that's a really good call out. Should we stop it there? Should we just end it? We can take a week off and then we're going to be going to Europe for Prague, which as John has already set up is probably the most excited that either of us have been about a World Cup in a couple of years. I can't wait to see Yanya and hopefully Natalia and the whole crew duking it out to see who's still on top. Um, until then, though, if you enjoyed this episode, make sure you... Uh, what's the what's the word subscribe to this channel like the video you can uh, donate money on patreon you can join the discord uh so you can chat about comps with us when they're happening but otherwise thanks as always to john for for joining me every single time we do one of these and of course it's always great to get somebody that was actually at the event on the broadcast so megan i really appreciate it thank you so much for for making some time just a couple days after i hope it was at least a little bit fun for you and your recovery you just spent like three days talking about competitions and then you sign up for more of it so thank you so much Oh, I loved it. Thanks for having me. This That's was awesome. Blast. Good stuff. Okay. Well, anyway, thank you for watching and uh, we'll see you guys at the next one in Prague.